Hello everybody, welcome to the Embedded and Gadget Track at the Linux Talk 2012. And a warm welcome to Luke Verhagen from CodeFink. Please give an applause. Thank you. He is working on graphic drivers since 2003. He made a driver for the VR Unicrom. He worked at the Core Boot, an alternative to proprietary biases. He made a free driver for the AMD Radeon chips at the with the SUSE team. And he uh, made external modules uh, for the uh, for the Mesa uh, 3D kit on the Linux. And today he holds a talk here about um, a graphical unit on ARM cores, which is called Mali. And I think it's the first open source 3D driver for an ARM platform. And this is something we are really, really looking for. Thank you. Thank you. So the Lima driver, liberating the ARM Mali GPU. This is part two already because part one was at FOSDEM. and that was the big announcement that we made there. We showed a few demos. It was pretty rudimentary and it was very hard work in a few months before that, but it was FOSDEM. It was already, what, three and a half months ago. At this point, it looks like it was a few centuries ago, so it was quite an exciting time then and a bit of, yeah, a bit of time for me personally afterwards. That was so insane. That's the time before that. So a free driver for ARM. Now, a year and a half ago, we were at FOSDEM with Kotink and we made ourselves a plan. In, x86, in the x86 world, we have three big players. We have Intel, we have AMD at an ATI, we have Nvidia, and they each have their own corner. Everything is pretty much said and done there. Intel has a huge team working on their open source graphics. Uh, AMD has a few guys working on their open source graphics. We were the guys, me and Egbert and um, like, uh, Matthias Hopf, we were the three guys that proposed this open source strategy to Radeon, or to ATI at the time. So we've been playing there as well, and it didn't work out that well for us, but a ATI, AMD chose their own corner. NVIDIA is on another corner again with a fully closed driver, and they're pretty happy with it. It's working very well for a lot of people, but it's closed source. But NVIDIA works, and they have their positions. They won't move from there. On the other side, we have all the ARM GPUs, and there are plenty of them, and there is no free driver for them. Reason for that is, for years and years, it wasn't really a big issue. People would provide a board and a board support package, and it should, and people just use that as is. They didn't change anything. You basically had one image, one machine, done. Nothing ever changed. So it wasn't really that important to be able to switch out graphics driver stack or update it or update a kernel or something. You just were stuck with it, what was there. And we're still in the situation today. We're still stuck with a graphics driver that you're provided with. But things have changed around it. Now we're looking in, into ARM servers. We also have proper ARM distributions. And even if you don't see an, an Android as a proper ARM distribution, for Linux at least, Cyanogen mod can be seen as a distribution. And their biggest issue is graphics drivers, drivers, closed source user space. This is holding up projects like that. Another thing is open source, all the technical advantages. We, I don't have to tell you guys. Easier to maintain this and that. We don't have that. It's all binary still, so we're all stuck. We were going to change that. So we formed that plan about a year and a half ago and thought, hey, why not just look at a driver and fix it? Make it open source and see what happens. So first we looked at, yeah, we talked a bit and thought, well, why not just look at the ARM one because it's probably, probably the nicest one. So we looked at it because the competition is PowerVR. Is Adreno is Video Core or Vivante, and I bother with them. ARM is a big name. It's most used to working on an open way. It has all the documentation internally. Um, everybody in, under an ARM license get all, gets all the code, so it is a pretty open environment already. So the best way forward is to work with a very open provider like ARM. Also, we were very lucky, and as, as will be shown in the next slides, we were very lucky with the Mali itself. The hardware itself is pretty well structured and relatively simple compared to some others. So since this 
uh, these GPUs are all embedded still. They're using OpenGL ES2. OpenGL ES2 is shader based, no longer a uh, fixed pipeline. So we have already a split there. We can work on one part of it, the infrastructure and the uh, command stream, and the other part is the compiler. Now the infrastructure and the command stream is the bit I focused on, and the compiler and the shader is something that I thought, well, somebody else can do it and we'll get to that later. So with a plan like that, what can go wrong there? It's easy, it should work quickly, it should be nice. Anyway, our hardware is the Mali 400 and the Mali 200, and here's a slide of the Mali 400. The Mali 200 just has a single fragment processor here and one vertex processor. Mali 400 can have multiple fragment processors. It's also a small update for some other things in the command stream, in the, but it has the same basic shaders, the same compiler, and so it was an easy way to go from, it was easy to go from Mali 200 to Mali 400. Now, this is a very simple diagram, and actually it's quite truthful. If I would have put up a slide from PowerVR here, I wouldn't be able to explain you anything, and nobody would understand anything. I don't understand anything, even though I worked on the thing before. This is a Mali 400. There's a bit more going on than what's on this slide, but not that much. This is conceptually quite okay. So this thing is about as fast triangle-wise of the vertex processor there. It pushes out the triangles. It's about as fast as an SGX, as a PowerVR as a PowerVR 530, SGX 530, which is uh, also available in the Nokia N9. It's just as fast triangle-wise, but it's a lot faster uh, pushing pixels if it has multiple fragment processors. Now, you're wondering now, where are we using these devices? Um, everybody knows the Galaxy S2. Samsung Galaxy S2 is the most sold Android phone of the last few years. It has a Mali 400 MP4 in it. It has four fragment processors. At the time when it came out, it was beating everything else in the market for the same segment. So this thing is, little thing is very, very performant even though it looks simple. It works quite well. So yeah, not only the um, Samsung Galaxy S2, it also came out with a faster version, the Galaxy S3 now. Um, it's also in the Galaxy Note and all the Galaxy tabs. It's the same Exynos uh, SOC from Samsung. But it's also available in lots of um, SOCs from small Chinese and Taiwanese vendors, like Telechips, AM Logic, All Winner, Rockchip, and recently even Via Technologies. So, I've come full circle there I'm with Via again. I started off with the Unichrome like nine years ago, and now I'm back and saying hello. I'm doing doing Mali again here. You should be talking to me again. Oh well, interesting, interesting how things go in this industry. So, by the, by the time we were looking into this was early 2011, it was like March 2011. Uh, only a Mali 200 was out at the time and it was only available in a single SOC which was only used for very cheap Chinese tablets. And the only real hardware out there was Android based, so we had to work with Android. Um, interface with it, build, build with it for it directly, and it was not a bit of interesting um, because at the time we don't, the Android that I was using, Android 2.2, didn't even have LD preload, which was, is used extensively in our reverse engineering. So I was lucky that somewhere around May, an uh, Android 2.3 came out with LD preload and working drivers, so that I could properly use LD preload instead of hacking around with ELF binaries. That was not nice. Anyway, this is what the Mali stack looks like on an Android. You have your OpenGL, GLES application uh, up there, talking to the two red bit, the three red bits here, where these are the closed source parts. This is the closed source user space. The kernel module is of course, because all these vendors are now complying, especially ARM is complying with the GPL, this is of course a GPL module. It's not in mainline yet, because first of all, I'm not sure it's clean enough, it's not kernel style at all. And secondly, there is no free user space, but we're changing that one. So it looks, on the first look, it was pretty simple and pretty logical. So, yeah, how else would you lay out a, an OpenGL stack? Oh. No. Yeah, let's go back. So all the red bits are the bits that we are, will be replacing. That was the reason why I went back. 
this is a bit closer look. As I first, as I first said on, uh, on, as I said on the first slide or the second slide, we can split up the job in infrastructure and shader work. And if you look at the actual, and this is to scale, the user space is to scale. This is how it divides up. The infrastructure are the yellow bits. The SSL compiler is, of course, a black bit. 30% of this big blob down here is infrastructure. That's only 30% of the whole user space. 50% is the shader compiler. Now, if you're doing this kind of reverse engineering job, you have to first ask yourself, what are my limits? What, where, how far can I go? How far can I go legally? And this is answered, what, what is this stuff doing in there? And the infrastructure here is pretty small, pretty clean. For a graphics average, it's unbelievably clean that the, this division is like that. The infrastructure actually has very little going on in it. It's basically building up the command stream, talking to the hardware, setting everything up so that you can run the shaders. There is nothing IP or intellectual property heavy in there. You will not find, I haven't found at all, uh, any stuff that could be said, this is ARM intellectual property. It's just compatibility. We're talking to the hardware, we're setting things up. So for the yellow bits, we were basically free to do, use any technique that was available to, to us as long as we didn't violate copyright. This is a pretty big help. Now the ESSL compiler, this is where all the optimization happens, this is where all the IP is. We had to use a completely different tactic there. And later on, uh, it will, I will show how nicely that worked out, or is working out. So if we're looking at infrastructure, and command stream, we have to first find out what the actual driver is doing. And those arrows there pretty much explain the whole story. From user space, we first talk to the kernel and ask them, so what hardware are we? Where's the memory living? How much memory are, do we have available at this point? The next thing over in IOCTL that you ask, the next thing you do is memory map, part of that memory, because you need something to put your command stream and to put your shaders and to put your data in and to render in the, in the end. So we just have an M map there. The next step is we build up all every, the whole command stream in memory and then send a job to the geometry processor, which is actually the vertex processor. Say, hey, it's finished here. Here is your job, here's your task here, a few bits there, a few addresses there. Go and run this. After a few milliseconds, this thing will come back and say, hey, I'm done, or you've gave me crap. I'm not running that. I've actually been, had a, been having a very hard time crashing this thing. It's been a really nice bit of hardware. It's not unlike some of the competition. So yeah, just comes back to you and says, I'm, I'm done. And then you can go and give the job to the um, fragment processor and it will just fi render the final render. It's actually pretty simple. There is no, nothing, no, no microcode being uploaded. There is no registers being touched from user space. It all happens in a few ioctals and an mapp and an open. So for reverse engineering, that makes it pretty easy. At least as soon as you have LD preload, we just LD preload above libc and capture all the libc commands that we need, which are open, mmap, and ioctal. That's all we need, nothing more. Once we have done the open, we know which file we are allocating memory from with or mapping memory from with mmap. When we call mmap, we track which memory, where it lives, uh, and then wait until finally the whole command stream is built up, capture that as well, and capture all the memory and store it to a file. That's how we work here. And we were lucky here because the whole command stream is built up before the GP job or the vertex uh, processor job is uh, submitted. And the other thing is queued in the thread for when the GP comes back, it can execute it quickly and, and in a separate thread. So the whole thing is built up at the GP point where there's still little data in memory as well. So we actually have a pretty limited set of data that we have to sort through right later on. So our mode of working for reverse engineering this driver, apart from a bit, a bit of decompilation, 
our mode of working is we create a single frame uh, OpenGL app. We run this frame, capture this command stream, then go back, replay this command stream on the hardware, change a few bits, replay this, uh, replace this, or replay this again on the hardware, and from that start building a driver. Now every, as I will explain in the demos later on, or I will show in the demos later on, every time we went a step further and a step further, and we could explain more and more about the hardware. It's all, it's of course easy to, be, to say, just look at a bit of a command stream, but you're looking at about a megabyte of text every time, which you can sort through and then alter some addresses. It's, it's interesting stuff. So where are we today? At, with, at least with the infrastructure part, we will get to the compiler part in a bit. And there are a few new things here from, from Fosden last time. So at Fosden, we were already running on Mali 200 and Mali 400. There are a few changes between the two. Um, the shader linking, it has been updated since then. There were quite a few changes needed to support the new stuff that I added. And uniforms and attributes and varieties have, uh, since then, yeah, only the varieties have changed significantly since then. The whole linking has changed. We're also doing multiple draws, but I will go over all the details in, in this last bit where I go through the demos. We now have a very high triangle count because I've been able um, to figure out what textures I've been doing as well. So I've now texture set up and I now pretty much have the whole command stream pinned down, at least the large blocks, so I'm more free to move stuff around. So now I have tons of memory available and can more easily handle that. So we now have pretty high triangle count as I will show. And later on there is also the demo app so that I at least have something to show on um, on an Android device when I'm trying to hold a talk. So the next bit, and this is something that I was not that much involved with myself, is all the shader work, all the compiler work, and we got unbelievably lucky here. The infrastructure depends on Android system libraries and talks through libc to the kernel and finds out a lot about hardware and needs to have a lot of state before it will do anything. The SSL compiler just uses malloc and free and a few of those bits. It doesn't need anything much. You could run it standalone uh, in an emulator and it will still work. Don't need to work on the hardware. It only has a single entry point. You provide it the type of shader, you provide it the structure where it should put its data, and you provide it the shader source as is. It will compile that and it will come back to you and say, hey, here's your data. And it gives you the binary, it gives you a bit of metadata. This is how I run my demos as well. This is how these tests happen as well. This is how the Limare infrastructure is currently built up. We use this compiler directly. That's the only thing we link to when we do our, our infrastructure work at this point. Couldn't be easier if you have a nice little, uh, little compiler, a nice little entry point like that. Now, when we are working with this block, we can't just go everywhere we want. We have to be a lot more careful. Luckily, it's also a lot faster and it's more easy to spot the differences when something does break. So, and I will get to the two guys that have been doing it in a bit. The, work, the workflow here that those two guys have been using is provide a shader, compile it, see what it does. I'll alter the shader slightly, compile it, compile it, see what it does. And it's actually a pretty limited set of data and it's easy to go from one tiny step to another, but it's something that I could have probably never done as I've never been uh, a processor designer or a child prodigy as you will see now. These are the two guys that have been doing all the shader work. This guy is Connor Abbott. He is a community member. He showed up like a month after the FOSDEM talk and he started working with Ben who is working for Coating. They started working, yeah, he's in the US, and well, over in the daytime, Ben would be working on it, and in the nighttime, for us at least, Connor would be working on it, and they would be communicating over IRC. These guys have been working at such a pace that I could have never imagined. In a month and a half's time, they had the fragment shader done. It was unbelievable. I never thought that this was possible. Now, Connor here, this is uh, a picture that I got from him via Via. This is a picture from him from American Scientific some, I think, American magazine. And this is him, age 12, 
when he built a Rubik's Cube solving robot. And the arm you see here is his little brother, who was a whiz kid at solving Rubik's Cubes. And he built this robot to pretty much pester his little brother to show that he could do it faster. Um, he built this using Mindstorms and some uh, programs that, uh, I think the, root, the algorithm was written by some, some professor in Italy. He brought this all together on age 12 and then showed us off and got a bit, bit of media coverage with that one, which is quite interesting. And this picture, 12 years old he was then, taken three years ago. He's 15 now, and what he does in his free time is reverse engineer shaders. How great is that? This is Ben from Coating, and Ben sitting over there with a Coating t-shirt, holding another beer again, or? Yeah, 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 yeah. Uh, um, ben has been designing processors at the university in the last few years and has now joined Coatink and immediately got a rather boring job to do there, right? So our status with the shaders, and I never could have imagined that it would happen so fast. It's been three and a half months. The fragment shader has a, a very long instruction word uh, architecture, and if you want to know what that is, Go and visit Wikipedia, I can't explain myself. Ben has made some really uh, nice wiki page about it with a full diagram with how the whole pipeline there works, which is quite nice, but uh, I don't want to know about it either. So if you're interested in that sort of thing, go to our wiki page. Ben has really made a, write, a nice write-up. So the status with that is we know the full instruction set. Save a few bugs, we know the full instruction set. We have a full disassembler. and we have a full assembler as well. We could program the shaders for the fragment shader directly and run it on the hardware. That's where we are at today. A compiler is still in the future because of course after you've done this sort of reverse engineering work on the fragment shader, you immediately, and you're that far ahead already, you move on to the next bit, which is the vertex shader. And we're still working on that one. This one is a lot more difficult as a transport trigger architecture. Um, this is quite efficient, apparently, and can push through a lot of data, but the computation happens as you push data through the pipeline, which makes it extremely hard to write, to get any readable assembler for it. So the instruction set at this point, we're well, pretty much 80%. Ben keeps telling me, yeah, well, there's a few unknown still, and maybe we're like 60% if it turns out to be a big unknown still. We could be 99% at this point as well. So that we have a basic shader disassembler. It's still a work in progress. And it's turning mostly into a, an, it's a, mostly a decompiler as well because otherwise it would just not be readable, not be usable. And the work has started on creating uh, an assembler. And of course then to make it readable, make it usable, a bit of a compiler as well. So wait, wait and see where that goes in the next few weeks. But Connor is still hacking all through the night while we all go out drinking here at Linux Talk. Connor is at home probably pestering his brother again and hacking on the, on the shaders there. It's amazing. So yeah, this is where we are at. Now we've set up, immediately we set up a lemadriver.org as a website. It's actually a big wiki, so if anybody has any information, even just information about devices, go in, or how to build stuff for your own device. You can go up there and, and alter the wiki. We have a mailing list which is surprisingly uh, low volume because all, all communication between, and it's a pretty big channel already for, for such a small project. It's about 20 people hanging around in there all the time. It's pretty active and they're mostly Connor and Ben are talking about shares, but still there's quite a lot going on. Um, it's easy to get hardware for this because it's, we have these seven inch ultra cheap Chinese tablets they cost like 70 euros. You can just carry them along and go to a conference and stick it in your backpack and hack on a, on a graphics driver without doing anything on your laptop yourself. You're just playing it over to the hardware. You can just carry it everywhere, on the plane, everywhere. It's pretty nice. So we have a full, um, we have the Limara stack working there. Ben has the, the shaders on Gitorius as well. It's all on Gitorius apart from the bits that I did in the last two weeks because it's too big of a mess still. You can build it, you can run our own tests that I will demo in a bit. You can build it, run it on your device, see it working, alter them and do the same things that we do. 
which is play stuff, alter them, analyze what's coming out. Now the next bit is going to be a bit tricky because I'm going to do the sh demoing of the devices, uh, what it does today. And for that, I have to use an HDMI 2 VGA converter. Oh, there we are. Which turns this tablet, and you will probably recognize this as the same hardware as the Spark or Vivaldi KDE Plasma tablet. But this is the original one from a Chinese manufacturer, which is actually a big bad GPLV violator. Anyway, so this is the little app that we, let's just go there. It's a standard Android. Oh, there's my cursor. And we have a little app for it. And this, this thing has now just turned into one big touchpad like you have on a laptop. So it's not really easy to use it. But we'll struggle through. So at FOSM, the first thing I showed off is the Hello Triangle. Oh, no, not Hello Triangle. It's not Hello Triangle. Triangle smoother. Everything you do with GL, you first start off with just showing a triangle. Seems like a pretty simple thing, right? But there's already quite a lot going on. Um, the first demos we did on OpenGL, the first captures I made at least, were made at a quarter of the size of this so that I could keep the amount of data down. Let's drink something first. Now this is using just no separate uniforms apart from the viewport and apart from the constants that the program is providing us. It's using the binary compiler, of course. Um, I was showing this triangle on this hardware at this resolution, like the second week of January of this year. So it took like 10 months before we got to this point. And after, after you've shown your first triangle, something that things really start moving. The FOSDEM where we were showing quite a lot more was just like three and a half weeks after that. So this is where our starting point was. We have the whole command stream set up here. Um, all the variables are still hard coded. So just this address, these values, not much parsing going on there yet. So yeah, but at least first triangle, something that I could call already an open source basic driver. Second stage is just altering um, the things we are drawing. Where were we? Smooth, smooth, cube, smooth. There's not the one. There we go. So we went with a fan, which is just alter. Say these are mo more points, and you're no longer drawing a triangle. You're drawing the next primitive in GL, a fan. Two minutes of work from the triangle. Same thing for the strip. It's just one var one. One, yeah, one byte in the whole command stream that alters, and a few more points there. So after that, and this took a week and a half to two weeks. Where is it down there? I showed that one. That took two weeks of work. It's more simple, and it took two weeks of work. All we have here is those four points. And then the other, uh, and on showing the triangle, we have those three points, and for each point you have a color. This means that you're working with two varieties. Here we have one varying and one constant, the uniform, one color, which changes the whole thing, which could be easy if I would just hard code it again. But this is a different shader, pro a different vertex and a different fragment shader. So I had to start parsing all the metadata that the, pro that the compiler was throwing us back. This took quite a while, quite a bit of work to get it kind of right. It wasn't completely right yet because I had to rewrite a few things in the last few weeks as well. So yeah, two weeks. Oh, and the interesting bit is, let's go there again. I was doing, up until this point, I was working on Mali 200 hardware. And then I moved to this device, and this was nicely showing in red on the Mali 200 hardware. It was showing in blue on this device. With like a week to go to FOSDEM where the big announcement was showing blue. There went another few hours until I found that bit. 
So once we got this uh, quad flat uh, showing nicely, we went with multiple draws. Multiple draws, two different objects being drawn with a different color. Once you have multiple draws, you can suddenly make things a lot more interesting. And where is the cube smoothed? No, that's not the one. Oh man, next time I'm bringing a mouse. So this is where we were at with Limaria at Fosdom. We're showing this cube, which is not that big a step from showing the two draws. This is actually just six draws and the same program that we were running the, the first triangle on. But I didn't, wasn't really satisfied with just this static cube for Fosdom. But this whole command stream build up was still such a mess that I couldn't change much. So I thought, well, this cube is already shaded it's already lighted properly, it's rotated, it's not just a static cube just showing there. Why not just alter this one matrix that does the rotation? Just alter that one, this one set of values, just alter that constantly and maybe we can get something nicely rotating out of that one. And this is what I showed at Fosdom. And it took me two days to, act, to try a few things because it's not working correctly, but this is what I was showing at Fosdom. Now it will go wrong. And it turns out that this is a caching issue. It's always the same command stream. I'm always submitting the same job back, back to the to the GP and the PP. To the, to the, submitting the same jobs, the same command stream, same addresses, and it just messes up in the, in the geometry between the two jobs. This was Fosdom. That was three and a half months, a century ago. Anyway, for the next three months, I didn't do anything. It was Ben and Connor's work. They were moving so fast on the um, on the two shaders there. It's, it's more than I could ever expect there. It was quite amazing. But I didn't do anything much until like three weeks ago. And I started adding textures. I said at Fosm, it will take like a few days to add textures, but it took quite a bit longer. So yeah, the Playboy girl, as we all know her, Lena. That's the standard texture. The standard for photography and for everything with imaging. So yeah, another structure was added to the whole command stream. The whole um, tiling pattern of, this, of, of these textures are already, whole swizzling of it had to be figured out. It was a bit interesting. But the big point here is after that, there were no big unknowns anymore, no big blocks that could pop up out of nowhere. So I could start playing with the actual organization internally and start playing with how memory is being used. So the next step was build up of the same, it's the same, it's always the same um, cube that we're showing, the same program. Now we've just put textures on the sides. Not that big a step from one to the other, of course. There's always stuff to figure out. There's always bits and that, we're, that we've missed or now using incorrectly. So going from one to the other is always a bit of work. So for Fosdom, we want to go one more step. And we're now showing the same, it's the same texture, it's a companion cube from Portal. And this is actually using more than 3,000 triangles. So we're getting to the point, this is using one texture, one, uh, one set of programs, 3,000 triangles. And so we're getting to the point where we can really start doing some proper 3D work. And since I now know so much about the whole command stream, I've done it properly now. And this is where we are at today. No more messing up. We have two different command streams running there. And it's rendering nicely, not smoothly because we're doing all, everything we're copying to the FB directly. We render it, get the buffer, throw it over to the frame buffer. And we're pretty lucky that it's showing this now on HDMI because Android is doing all sorts of crazy stuff there. So this is where we are at today. After more than a year of work, this is still running on the binary compiler. 
And I don't think we can run Vertex Shader already off of what our own work, right? Fragment, yes. But we're pretty close. We will get there. This is running in 5,000 lines of infrastructure code, 5,000 lines of C. A year and three months of work. That's all I have, and not inside the time as well. Look, thank you very much for this really interesting talk, and Ben and Luke and Connor for this really great work. Thank you. We appreciate that very, very much, and I think all you here have some questions to look. Yep. So, feel free. Nobody, okay. In the back. Yeah. Um, Coating is a British company. Um, one of the guys at Coating has been in this industry for 20 years. And he used to work at Cyan in the 90s. So I hope that answers your question. I have a question. In the beginning, you talked uh, that uh, ARM was a very nice company, had everything, it's open, and so on. And now you have to reverse engineering uh, one of their graphic drivers. Um, what, what is the point? It's, it's not open, or is it closed? Or I've been doing this Radeon and Z stuff before. It's hard to get a big company to change overnight. So it will probably take some time, but we will get there. So they have, have a non-disclosure agreement, or? I don't have any information from ARM. I, all I have is there's public or the binaries. That's all I have. OK. Any more questions? OK. Uh, I give you a microphone. Like you're building that on, on top of uh, the Mesa OpenGL infrastructure, or do you we really? Will. We are not you at will. that point okay. yet. We're not at that point yet. So um, this is something I did. I, I quickly threw together before FASM. I quickly threw together some slides on the train over. Just was no time for anything. And I put in a future slide, and it turned out that it was quite wrong. We said, I said, oh, we'll use Mesa. We'll try to use Gallium 3D as much as we can, mm -hmm. but we want to have this point where we can always throw in the binary compiler from ARM still. Okay. Since we have this nice interface, we could throw in the one or the other, our own compiler or the binary compiler from ARM and compare at both sides. But we will get there. Um, we will not be using the Gallium infrastructure fully. We will be doing an Intel there. We will okay. have our old style driver with our own compiler, probably based on T TGSI on tungsten graphics um, and um, shader implementation. Uh, but we will be not doing it in full Gallium. We will be able to throw back and forth the two compilers, and that's something that Gallium does not allow today. Okay, so that that's already um, no. gives 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 an. This, uh, is, this uh, is where we are. This is where we are, and we're now at a point. If I clean up this big mess of code that I made in the last two two weeks and push it out, then maybe we can somewhat start looking into writing the Mesa driver. But there's still so many bits and bobs left and right to figure out. It's a better uh, way of spending our time is just figuring it out properly and then start cleanly without having to hack around in Mesa much. Just start building it nicely and as we know most things. Um, I'd like to allow two more questions and then I think we are out of time. I see someone but yes, here. We'll, we'll talk about this tonight over, over beer, so it's fine. Just, just a quick question. Yeah. Is uh, this all in user space? I'm not touching the kernel at all. We want to keep this kernel interface as is. So we, we so we kept we, we went. Uh, I would have to hook this up again. I just L did LD preload and saw all the stuff flying by. And uh, um, the final render is dumped in the frame buffer. So the Limaris stuff is running standalone, and we have small demo programs. These demo programs actually work through link to Limari directly, and this links to the compiler. Only the compiler, nothing more. And Bionic, so Lipsy. Um, 
And these things actually look like GL, simple GL programs. We're not, we don't have to do as much state setup as you do in, in, in anything GL. But it, it, for any GL programmer, it's actually easy to write a Limara demo as soon as the support in the back end is there. But we will not be touching the kernel soon because we still want to have this compatibility. We still want to be able to compare to the original driver. We have to get performance, not the, we don't need to have the exact same performance, but we should be in the same league. We shouldn't be like 5% of the performance and nobody will ever use it. Yeah, another question. Um, thank you, Luke and uh, Ben and uh, the crazy kid with a Rubik's Cube <laughs> for doing all that reverse engineering work. And my question would be, you have been talking about the 3D stuff. What about 2D acceleration in this uh, chipset for graphics and power management? Is there also work to do or is it already provided? That's always SOC dependent. Not always, but most of the time it's SOC dependent. The whole 2D acceleration on, for instance, the Exynos, I think they're making this free at this point. Sam that's uh, Samsung's own IP and Samsung is pushing it out, pushing it into the kernel. Samsung is being pretty nice with, with the whole um, Linux stuff and is, they're uh, contributing quite a lot. So, But this is not Samsung's IP to give up. That's ARM's IP. Okay, not thank you. So thank you again, Luke, for this great talk. Yeah. And the next talk will be... Thank you guys for listening. Please give a applause to Luke. <laughs> the next talk 